Hurricanes have always been natural Galveston's way of keeping the island's built environment in check. A strong hot wind, a few notches below hurricane strength might dismantle any of the rickety Gulfside fishing piers. A, a category five storm might sweep the island clean. So what are the builders of the sports bars, the big hotels, convention centers, and chain resorts thinking? Maybe they trust the great seawall, a constant in the character of artificial Galveston, which was erected after the 1900 storm and worked quite well for nearly a hundred years, despite the double tornadoes that Hurricane Carla sent tearing through town in 1961. Or maybe the corporate investors in the island are banking on making enough money between storms to offset their losses when the big one comes. They could take a tax break and make up the deficit at their Miami or Singapore sites. Whatever the local conditions, they live by the laws of a global economy. Or maybe they try not to think too much about it. That would be the way of virtuality, not thinking about it, losing the mental and physical connection with the natural place and its limits on artificial character. Actually, this seems to be the goal of many of the new attractions on Galveston Island. Moody Gardens, the Rainforest Cafe, Schlitterbahn, all of which I group under the heading of virtual reality. In virtual reality, you purposely lose sight of where you are in order to see someplace where you are not. You enter the rainforest pyramid of Moody Gardens and leave behind the laughing gulls and gulf atmosphere of natural Galveston. The air is still humid in the pyramid, but cooler in the shade of real tropical trees. Ficus and other things that I think of as house plants grow impossibly huge. The cries of birds are different too, uttered by species that would never naturally test the airspace of East Texas. And a few rare visitors, like the striking scarlet ibis, a sample of which I once saw flying over the West Bayside grasslands of the island, though it might have been a white ibis painted scarlet by the sunset. In one corner of the Moody Pyramid is an artificial bat cave. There are ponds with monster catfish and other Amazonian wonders. If you crane your neck long enough, you might catch sight of the silent, yet surprisingly large tree sloth. If you don't see it, you might smell it. A musky odor not to be sniffed in the natural world on this side of the equator. Though we are nature lovers and the worst kind of granola crunching tree huggers, Jackie and I, that's my wife, I introduced her earlier in the story. Jackie and I, like so many of our generation, are also godchildren of Walt Disney. We can't help but enjoy Moody Gardens. In 2006, we bought our first annual pass and visited several times. Jackie saw the sloth. I only smelled it. We delighted especially in going to the rainforest pyramid at night when the bats are most active and largish quail-like birds look back over their shoulders at you as they scamper ahead on paved pathways. Most of all, we enjoyed the small ironies. The place has mice. We saw them sampling the bird feed in one exhibit and for a brief moment felt the ironic intersection of the natural and the virtual. Are these mice supposed to be here? Uh, of course they are, but not by any plan of Moody Gardens. We followed a long line of parents with kids into the 3D theater, put on the funny glasses and listened to Johnny Depp narrate a film of the underwater world, luxurious coral reefs, ingenious schemes for predation, sharks and rays and colorful clownfish, tentacled anemones and pensive faced sea turtles. We went, Whoa, with the rest of the audience, when a big fish seemed to swim out of the screen as if to land in our laps. Later, we tried the 4D theater, 4D, and felt little splashes of water in the rumble of movement beneath our seats. Whoa, we said with a laugh. We went to the aquarium, where through a thick glass we could watch penguins loitering on a fake Antarctic landscape. We noticed a fishy smell, but learned to ignore it. Um, <clears throat> we watched the penguins effortlessly gliding at high speeds, then popping up to break the surface from underwater like a balloon you had suddenly released after holding it down. They invariably landed on their feet to waddle again among their peers on dry ground. Children with faces pressed against the glass let go laughing, their chubby legs pumping with delight. 
We saved late afternoon that day for natural bird watching, but as we positioned ourselves at the viewing post set up by the state park, a thick fog rolled in from the gulf. We sighed and headed back to the car. Such a thing would never happen at Moody Gardens. <laughs> that night, we, we met our niece and her little daughter at the Rainforest Cafe and enjoyed decent but expensive food under plastic models of generic jungle flora, while at regular intervals, big plastic animals, an elephant and some monkeys, awakened and moved their mechanical appendages and emitted computerized calls. Members of my generation think of the soundtrack from a Tarzan movie. After dinner, we stood in the courtyard in front of the restaurant and actually felt the heat when the simulated volcano on the roof of the place erupted with tongues of fire. Across the courtyard in front of the little tiki hut, we watched real Polynesian dancers in grass skirts demonstrating their art and then recruiting some of the tourist kids to learn the dances. Later, the performers came back in street clothes and joined the same kids in hip-hop line dancing. The light of the volcano and the flaming firebrand set up around the courtyard blocked out any chance of seeing the beach across the street or the stars overhead. We were enveloped in this consensual fantasy of a tropical island, a virtual island on a natural island. Next day, late in the afternoon, I stood in the bathwater warm surf at the eastern end of the island in front of the seawall. The air temperature had dropped to about 90, and the water was only slightly cooler. I walked out a long way. It was shallow there. I was barely waist deep after a hundred yards of wading. Fish were leaping all around me in the muddy water, hundreds of fish ranging from fingerlings to five pounders. I had read that the unusually heavy rains of that summer, not this past one obviously, had created a dead zone offshore. The burden of fresh water pouring into the gulf from the Brazos and other big rivers was floating on top of the heavier salt water. The condition called hypoxia creates a freshwater cap that deprives the life below of oxygen. The less mobile creatures like clams and oysters suffered in place, while those able to swim hightailed it for better water, hurting the shrimp and fish industry. Where had the fish gone? Apparently to the beach at Galveston to swim among the sweating tourists. Here they were in 4D, close enough to touch. They were leaping into the air, I suppose to discover where they actually were considering the murkiness of the water. I could see the stripes and the colors on their slender forms right in front of me. Whoa, I said out loud, my voice drowning in the sound of mild surf and gulf, gulls laughing in the sky above. Thank you.